afternoon everybody and thank you so much for joining today's Women of Nats webinar. Um, I'm so pleased that so many of you have tuned in this afternoon for a session that we hope will be really insightful um, and thought for thought provoking as well. Um, and also I'm very, very excited because we've got some very exciting spokespeople um, to talk to this afternoon. And um, what we really want to do is make this session as interactive as possible. So as we go throughout today's session, please, please don't hold back and asking questions. That's the whole point of us putting this on this afternoon. Um, so my name is Helen Fuge and I'm head of organisational design and talent at Nats. Um, what does that mean? Lots of people say <laughs> it's quite a, quite a broad title and, and quite hard to interpret. So my role centers really on people transformation. So it looks at the design and structure of the organization, looks at our culture, um, learning and development initiatives that we have in place at Nats, um, and most importantly, talent and succession as well. So how do we truly build that talent pipeline and the succession plans for our organization and obviously ensuring that we're thinking about culture as part of that. Um, in short, I suppose the best way of summarising um, the area that I focus on is encouraging employees to reach their full potential. And, and that's great. I really enjoy that because obviously it's a really exciting thing to focus on. Um, I'm hoping the majority of you that have joined our session this afternoon have heard of Nats before. But please do not worry if you haven't. Being really open with you, I hadn't heard of Nats um, before I um, enjoyed the organisation. So we will start this afternoon's session by informing you a little bit more about who we are and what we do. Um, but before we sort of launch into um, what, who Nats are and what we do, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping rules actually this afternoon. Um, we would like to record today's session um, because we feel that it's a really exciting offering that we have and we'd like to obviously share this on our website afterwards. What I would say is if you're not comfortable um, being seen or, or being heard this afternoon, then please feel free to stay on mute and keep your camera off. We will, however, ask you to do both of those things unless you have a question, just because it helps with the bandwidth and the Wi-Fi as well. As we go through this afternoon's session, if you've got any questions, um, I would ask you to utilise the chat function uh, and also to use the raise the hand function if you are familiar. So you will see at the top of your screen a smiley face with a hand up. Um, if you do want to raise your hand and ask a question this afternoon, if you click on that button, you can then click on the hand, which will enable the raise the hand function. And like I said, we really do want this interactive. So please, please, please do ask questions as we go through this afternoon. Um, before we go any further and before I introduce you to our, our fantastic panel, what I'm going to do now is just show you a very short video which explains a little bit more about life at Nats. Two things define us and drive everything we do. The first is safety, our duty of care. It's what we've always done and what we'll always do. The other, a constant striving for improvement. To meet the challenges and opportunities we face. The world's airspace is changing. Greater volume, faster travel, unmanned technology, and it's happening now. Our job isn't just to keep the skies safe, but to continue to keep them safe. In the face of this shifting skyscape, with its changing rules and ever-increasing intensity and complexity, it's busy up there. The flow of aircraft needs to be handled with ever greater precision and predictability. And we're developing technologies and systems to do exactly that. Rising to the challenge, delivering change in positive and ingenious ways. 
unlocking capacity through increased efficiency. Leading the way. Helping our customers improve their operational effectiveness and achieve ever higher levels of performance. With the right combination of people and technology, we're evolving and innovating, but with one thing constant, safe in everything we do, always. Our people working together to support you. So as you can see from the video, the foundation of our organisation is air traffic control. Um, we've obviously multiple other commercial ventures that we support, but with the air traffic control, we also have to have the support function. So as we move across this afternoon, you'll meet multiple individuals within our organisation who serve multiple roles to ensure that every single day we can keep the skies safe. Um, one of the, the big drivers, I suppose, in terms of us wanting to do um, this webinar this afternoon was really to try and encourage more applications into our organisation. And in November last year, we launched our Early Careers programmes. Um, what we are looking to do um, for 2022 is to recruit 49 new individuals into our organization um, across four key areas and you can see them highlighted here so we've got safety and cyber people and transformation engineering and technology and finance and analytics um, in order for us to really really be an effective business we want to ensure that we continue to bring talent in um, but we are trying to push more females to apply to work in NATS as you all know um, it's a struggle for engineering companies to attract females into the organization um, we do an awful lot as an organization to do outreach with schools and colleges we launched um, a program initiative called Called Future Minds, which was centred again on raising aspirations around females joining organisations such as ourselves. Um, and at Nats, we genuinely believe that diversity is exceptionally important for us. What we really want to explore this afternoon and to really highlight is the success of the females within Nats, but also, most importantly, to really encourage other females to want to apply to work at Nats, and obviously everybody obviously we want to encourage all talent but specifically this event is aimed at targeting females to to increase our applications into the organization um, so as we go through this afternoon like i said what we want to do is to answer any questions that you have and we're lucky today to be joined by a really inspiring panel um, so our panel today consists of Soraya Robertson, we have Zoe, we have Jody, Camilla and Linda. And what I'm going to ask each of them to do before we go into our Q&A today is to provide with you a bit of an overview of um, their role at Nats. We we'll then go into some open questions this afternoon. Um, so in no particular order, I'm going to come off of sharing the screen now and I'm going to start um, with asking for my first introduction. And Linda, would you be happy to leave with the introduction <laughs> this afternoon? Yes, I'm um, Linda Klein. Um, been working for Nat for um, many, many years, probably over 20 years. I started off as a software engineer. Actually, actually I started off as an administration officer and then um, did a university degree, which was sponsored by NAT and became a software engineer. And now I'm a senior systems integrity engineer. Thank you. Uh, Jodie, would you be happy to, to do an overview? Hi, yeah, I'm Jodie McMenamin. My current role in NATS is uh, to manage a group of air traffic control assistants who support the operation across both our centres at Swanwick and Presswick. I've been with NATS a similar amount of time to Linda, I think, I, I think about 23 years. And I joined NATS as a trainee air traffic controller. 
and I've had various roles. I was trying to work it out the other day. I think I've had 10 different jobs in the 23 years that I've been with that. So I, I've done lots of different uh, jobs in and around the air traffic control operation. Thank you, Jodie. Zoe. Hi, I'm Zoe Harrower. Um, I'm currently seconded from NATS to ACOG, so that's the Aerospace Change Organising Group. Um, and I'm an Aerospace Change Technical Analyst, and I followed this, um, got this role after the completing of the NATS Graduate Programme. Um, and before NATS, I completed a degree in Tourism and Airline Management, and I have a Master's in Airport Planning and Management, and I've also worked for Edinburgh Airport. Thank you, Zoe. Soraya. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome along. I'm Sarah Robertson. I lead the change management and the benefits management team in NATS, um, which means we're responsible for making sure that the people side of change, so what's sometimes called the softer side, is taken care of and we can deliver the benefits from the investments that our customers um, uh, fund for us to make sure that we're advancing aviation. I joined NATS 16 years ago. I'll be honest with you, I didn't plan to stay this long. But in that time, I have done eight different roles. I've worked in three different uh, parts of the company um, and I've always found opportunities to progress. Thank you, Soraya and Camilla. Hi, I am Camilla Casti. I am an analyst. I work in analytics. Um, I primarily work in the ops and safety team which means that I work on doing some of the maths that helps us figure out if the operation is performing as efficiently as it could be, and if it's performing as safely as it could be. Some of that work happens under Soraya, in fact, where what I do is I work on when a new tool for air traffic control or there's a change in the airspace, we help determine whether that's going to be as safe as it could possibly be and efficient, whether it's going to be really maximising that change for our customers. Um, I joined NATS two years ago after completing my PhD in marine biology. Not, not, not in aircraft, not in engineering, marine biology. Thank you, Camilla. And Camilla, actually, I'm going to come straight back to you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you mentioned then that's a good lead in about the fact that you obviously had done marine biology. So what, what encouraged you or, or made you think about becoming an analyst? Where, where, where did that step change come in? So I always liked science. I always knew I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, growing up, I wanted to be a dentist. Didn't go into dentistry, went into marine biology, purely because it sounded like, quite simply, the coolest science. Um, I had a wonderful four years at the University of Southampton, and I just very much enjoyed it. Uh, so I had another wonderful four years at the University of Southampton doing a PhD. When that came to an end and I considered did I want to apply for a postdoc I kind of considered what would that involve signing up for and going on to stay in academia you do less science you form more a part of management you do a lot more teaching a lot more um of the side which took me away from what I actually liked which was answering questions playing with numbers um and considering I'd originally wanted to be a dentist it wasn't that I heard some huge passion for marine biology. I just thought it was interesting. And when I looked at jobs that would allow me to play A with numbers in an interesting field, uh, I didn't know what sounded more than both of those things than to work at NETS. So I feel like it's a very, it's never a dull day. Um, there's so much information that you can just sink your teeth into and you really get to play with that much like kind of very strangely similarly to research science it's not just about what is the answer to this you have to figure out what the question is first whether that's working with customers or just having this huge volume of data the amount of data that's generated by NATS every day just conducting its normal operation is pretty significant and so you can't just go in and say yep that's that you actually have to figure out well what what do I need to know before you can get to that answer it's it is the any person who likes science would like working at NATS because it's a big playground for, for numbers, for data, for just satisfying curiosity. I love that phrase, Camilla, a playground. I think that's the, that's a great way of capturing, obviously, the enjoyment of your role. And um, probably looking at um, Jodie and Linda, I suppose, with this next question, obviously, obviously Jodie coming in, being an air traffic controller, and Linda yourself from an engineering perspective, very male-dominated environments. Um, 
did you find that intimidating, I suppose, in terms of considering your career choice? How, how did you find that? Do you want to go first, Jodie? OK, yeah, so <laughs> I think um, I don't think I was particularly intimidated by it. I think I, I grew up um, in an environment where my dad, my dad was an engineer and my sister wanted to be an engineer. And actually, my sister works for NAS as an engineer. Um, and we were just really encouraged to be anything that we wanted to be. And I really didn't realise that it was even a thing until I started with NATS. And then, it was a very long time ago, the, the men on the course made it quite clear that, that you know, really women needed to be a bit quieter and a bit more sort of put back in their place. Or that's how it felt, certainly, back in the day. And so that just made me all the more determined to not let it hold me back and bother me. It's pretty much the same reason why I carried on playing the violin for 15 years, because my mum said she didn't like it. So really, <laughs> anyone sort of giving me that sort of challenge to, to sort of overcome. And then actually, once I got into the proper operational environment, it was never a thing. You know, in the, in the ops room, I think it's about 30% female and 70% and male. But there's such a wide variety of different people with different interests and um, different backgrounds and it really doesn't matter what your interests are or what your background is you'll find people that are like-minded and I think that's the, the kind of joy of working in a big operational environment you get to meet lots of different people and then as I've sort of moved into leadership roles I guess I've taken more of a sense of responsibility around and trying to encourage women into more uh, leadership roles um, and I think over the years as a as a as a mother, a working mother, that's been quite challenging. And um, I've had great support from, from my husband. Um, but I've always felt encouraged by the the my colleagues. Um, and and so now I've got a real sort of passion for trying to encourage other other women into into leadership roles. And and I think you you everyone brings something different to leadership and it doesn't I think I've I've learned to value what I've brought and know that it's different and value that and 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 so I, it doesn't really bother me anymore I don't think but yeah it's changed times from when I was first uh, enrolling my nats all those years ago. Absolutely, thank you, Jodie. And I suppose for yourself, Linda, if you're happy to talk us through your your journey, obviously coming into engineering. Yeah. Um. Just similarly to to Jodie, I have um my sisters are engineers. Um, and so they work in a in you know male dominated environment. So it just seemed it seemed like a cool thing to do, a cool challenge actually. Um, but but that wasn't the main reason what I got why I got into um, engineering, particularly software engineering, was really because of the money. I'm so ashamed to say because it actually paid really well. Mm -hmm. So that was my first attraction, and. Um, I didn't have a degree, Nat's paid, Nat was my fairy godmother, to be honest, just looked after me all the way through, paid for me to do my degree um, and a master's and um, then working on lots of different projects just sort of made made it a lot more interesting. But it was, it was um, a struggle because I just didn't fit the image and I was told a few times, this is many, many years ago. So I had to like tone down myself, um, and there wasn't a di direct entry graduate scheme. There wasn't uh, an early careers scheme. Then it was, I don't know how we were recruiting then. It was, it was, it, it just seemed, I, I don't, I don't know how it was done. I mean, I, I, I applied internally for my, for my job. So I don't know who we were actually advertising externally. It was just really quite, quite tedious. So mm. it's changed quite a bit now to how it was then. And, um, yeah, I just just sort of just ended up in it because of the money and because I do actually like engineering also. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got to add, um, that was it really. But it yeah. sounds like you've had a really positive journey in terms of that continuous support around your development and, and how you've moved through the organisation. Yeah, um, yes, I have. Um, the, I've worked on lots of different um, projects because of what I do. So there's been a lot of um, variety. I've worked abroad. Nats has sent me out to Madrid. I was out there for six years working working on one of our systems. So that was was absolutely great. I wouldn't think of working anywhere else, to be honest. Nats is um, really cool. 
thank you, Linda. I'm going to pause for a moment. Um, now, obviously, what we do want this afternoon is, is in, in an interactive section, so I don't want it just to be me asking the panel members questions all afternoon. Um, like I said earlier, there is the chat function, and there's also the raise the hand function. So I'm just going to pause there for a moment, just in case any of our any of our guests this afternoon have any questions that they would like to put towards the panel at all. Beth, have we got anything in the chat at the moment? Not at the moment, Helen, no. Well, what I will do is I will continue with my questions and that will give you plenty of time if you do have questions, obviously, to use either of those functions this afternoon. Um, I'm going to go to Soraya next. Soraya, obviously you've talked about your role in change management. I suppose one thing um, that I'm really interested to understand is what do you find most challenging about your role? Most challenging? Um, I think we've got some wicked problems we try to solve in the business. So um, actually it's really interesting uh, just thinking about how we uh, we continually evolve the information that we share with customers to help them uh, make decisions around what they want to invest in, invest in, they want us to invest in, particularly given the constraints that, that are on the industry now after two years of you know, massively reduced income and traffic. Um, so that's, that's a, a challenging part of my role, um, the job, so to speak. Um, sometimes they, you know, things happen, you know, people in my team will need to take some time off. They may be poorly, they may need to look after relatives and, uh, you know, you have to step in and manage resources or sometimes yourself, you know, learn things pretty quickly to keep things moving along, um, which is good because it always stretches the old grey matter a little bit. Um, uh, so, you know, some of the learning can can be challenging in itself because it's it's new, right? Um, I think, you know, also I've had two kids once I've been at Nats and, you know, just trying to navigate that going from having just me to look after to then having, you know, children and, and a career and juggling that and dealing with the, you know, guilt or the um, pressure that you might put on yourself if if you want to do a good job or you, you want to, you know, continue to, to deliver for people um, without any kind of recognition that you've got other things to think about and then coming full circle and going actually they're okay to know that I need to stop now I need to go somewhere I need to do something but that was a can more probe, career challenge. Can I probe on that point in particular because as you were talking we've had a question in the chat mm. um, which um, from Kirsty which says more of very interested actually in, in how people find the work-life balance so on that point in particular Soraya how do you find the work-life balance you talked there obviously about your home commitments as well how how does yeah. that work on a day-to-day -day basis uh on a, so uh, three things I'll say about that number one we've we've had to go remote in that to protect our operation and follow government guidance etc um so we had to kind of convert overnight to working in this way which we've absolutely nailed now um, as an organization but that commute time that um firewall if you like that was between home and family is now just a door thin um <laughs> so you know from for myself i have to be very very good and a lot better than i was about OK, now I'm stopping work and then yeah. close the laptop and now I'm going into this different role, which is mum and wife and, you know, daughter and all those kinds of things. So that's, um, you know, been a juggle uh, from the work side. I've been without exception, always had a manager who I could sit down with and be really straight and say, right, what do you need me to do? Let's talk about when you need it. This is what I need from you in terms of support. Can we make that work? And we always have. In fact, I've had some managers that have said, and I've worked part time, full time, compressed hours. I've had some managers that have just said, oi, what are you doing working on your day off? Clear off. It can wait till Monday. And that's more the third thing about managing yourself and uh, just being OK to have boundaries around these things. But you feel overall that the organisation has supported that work life balance? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, very much so. Um, the policies are in place to make it easy for managers to do their job, the flexible working. Um, culturally, I think we've got better and the pandemic really helped, mm -hmm. you know, proving that you can do your job from anywhere. Whereas before, I think there was a, 
because in that there's a real strong sense of um, family and community amongst people and we enjoy spending time together and it's uh, you know there's 4,000 people but you know lots of people within that or you have a really tight group within that so suddenly to be flung to the wind you know to the winds um, was different um, but uh, you know, we've just found different ways of staying connected and then, you know, even got more disciplined about making sure we're reaching into other parts of the business as well and not missing those corridor conversations. So, yeah, I think the company's done well. Thank you. And that question, if I put it out to other panel members and then for anybody to respond actually around that work-life balance, um, it, would you echo Sarai's comments there in terms of, of feeling supported in terms of that? What, how do others feel? Yeah, I, I would definitely echo Soraya's comments around the, the pandemic actually having really shifted things forever. Uh, and there are some real pros and, and cons to that. So I I was at work a lot before the pandemic, long hours, and some of that actually brought on by myself. Um, and because I felt like when I left work, I wanted to leave work and I didn't want to, to have that. I wanted that clear distinction between work and home. And so that's tricky, actually, as you say, so I think you put it perfectly when you say you've now just got to open the door and it's there. And that's a challenge. But actually, the flip side of that is I'm here and I'm seeing a lot more of my family and I'm able to pop a washing on in the morning or prepare a meal. Uh, so so it's it, it's been a real eye opener and stuff that I would have been worried about before. So I would have been worried maybe about saying I need to go and pick my kids up or I need to do this. Everyone's saying it now because we're all we're all working at home so suddenly now it's it's culturally that is what Nats is like everyone's very understanding of that flexible working arrangement and and people are pretty much able to do what they need to be able to do as long as they get their work done which is is really great actually it's really it, it's really freeing and it's it's allowed us to make different decisions at home so my husband for example started a new job this week that he just couldn't have done but really because I was making the rules up myself and, and denying him that opportunity because I needed him to be at home. Whereas actually now the culture's different and, and he can do what he wants to do as well, which is great. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And and anyone else from a work-life balance perspective and in, in terms of, of how they found that? I mean, I think if I look at sort of Camilla and Zoe from from probably slightly newer members of staff, how have you found that from a, from a balance perspective? Um, I'll let Zoe speak first because I've I witted on earlier. Um, thank you. Um, so I would say, so I did a year-ish in the office before we went into work from home. And I would say that flip between going into work from home, where you could see the distinct difference. As you say, nobody questions us anymore if we need to pop and put the kettle on and that type of thing. I actually painted my bedroom today at lunchtime. You would never have popped home at lunchtime and gone and painted your bedroom and popped back to the office. Um, so actually, I really enjoy that kind of flexibility of being like, oh, it's a really nice day today. I'm gonna have a bit of a longer lunch break. I'll work a bit later towards dinner and take that kind of sunshine when you get it kind of thing. Yeah. Which again, but in the office, I might have never actually even gone outside at lunchtime, never mind gone for a nice walk and seen the seaside. So yeah, it's, it works for me. I would so, agree entirely. It, it helps me feel that I'm, I'm living my life in a way that the time that I spend at work I spend at work, I'm at this desk, but the time that I'm not, particularly that little lunch break, I wouldn't have been working. And now I get to to lean into that, to to put the, sometimes it is just putting the wash on, but sometimes it is getting out and about, or I can do my food shop in that 40 minutes, and then I have the evening to myself. It's a different kind of, of structure. Um, and I think there is still that, a degree of difficulty in logging off, but I think it's more of a self-imposed one, at least for me, it's the feeling of, Oh, I don't need to get home. I, there's no traffic to worry about. I can work a little bit longer. Um, and that's difficult to balance, but it's it's also a thing that if it helps you and you want to have that extra hour, by all means, because you know that, well, you can have an extra nice long lunch at lunchtime tomorrow. So uh, swings and roundabouts, but I had a grand total of about nine working days in the office before we started working from home. So I'm possibly not the utmost authority. That said, <laughs> during... Um, coming from the PhD, I did a lot of that working from home. Um, so I've actually found it's actually quite a nice return to something that I knew suited me. So I think if you have a background, particularly um, 
maybe people who are applying through early career schemes and are worried like, oh, I, an office job will be a big adjustment. There are always going to be times for a kind of office-y structure, but this is, I think, a nice supportive way to get into the flow of still a strong and productive workday, but one where you can go for a walk at lunchtime or paint your bedroom. <laughs> Thanks. Now, Zoe, there's quite a lot of interest in the chat for about your role in particular. So a couple of questions we've got there is actually you sharing your experience of being a graduate. So um, what your expectations were, I suppose, coming into NATS, what your onboarding experience was like and, and really how you feel that whole experience has been as a as a graduate going through. Um, OK, hi. Um, so, yeah, so I did airport planning and management as a master's. Uh, prior to that, I did airline tourism and airline management as a degree. I definitely knew that I wanted to go into the aviation industry. I also knew that I didn't want to go back to an airport. I had worked at an airport before and I wanted to do something slightly different that connected the airlines and the airports together, which is where Nats came in. So it was actually a specific, I seeked out the company kind of decision. Um, the graduate programme was great, um, the recruitment process was fantastic, I genuinely couldn't fault them. Um, in fact, the job I was given wasn't the job I applied for because during the recruitment process they said we think this one would be better for you and definitely it was, it was spot on. Um, and then during that programme, yeah, absolutely supported. Any concerns I raised were dealt with. Um, so your first placement, obviously they don't really know you that much they've met you a couple of interviews they've read your cv kind of thing during that first placement they really picked up about what i knew what i liked i picked up about what i liked about the business and then you got the choice to kind of feed into your second placement they also kind of gave recommendations and you could really from that second placement onwards really kind of make your program what you wanted um, and that's exactly what i did and i said you know like i really enjoyed this i'd like to try that i did a placement in project management, um, whereas three of my placements were in airspace change. I did one in project management just because it was something a bit different and I just wanted to try it. Um, and they allowed that, that was totally, everything was fine with that. Um, so yeah, I can't fault them. Everyone was really good at like supporting it and kind of encouraging me to get what I wanted out of it. Having said that, I think if you sat back and just kind of waited to see what happened, you wouldn't have got as much out of it. You really have to want to kind of pull things out of your program and kind of make it your own but everybody I know all like my friends from the graduate program they all raved about it so yeah Thank you, Zoe. And just uh, just a follow up, if I may. Um, we've had uh, another question in the chat. Just wanting to know a little bit more about your responsibilities um, from an airspace change perspective. So if you're happy to just do a little bit of an overview of your, your current role. OK, um, so I'm going to go a bit backgroundy. Um, so ACOG are responsible for dealing with the airspace changes of the FASI South and FASI North. So it's 21 airports and uh, NATS, these high level network changes. Um, so we have 22 airspace changes that we're responsible for kind of facilitating and progressing. Um, my role within that is doing a whole bunch of stuff. So looking at strategies for how they can coordinate the consultation. So it, they are required to each do a consultation but their consultations might overlap because of the kind of proximity of the airports to each other. Um, how we can explain cumulative impacts, that's the same kind of thing. There will be a noise impact or an environmental impact, track mile impact of each of the ACPs, but then again, they're close together, so they will be combined as well. Um, we're also looking at the stakeholders of all of these ACPs, um, and then lots of kind of internal stuff. So like I've been given the role of um, upscaling within our department. Um, I'm currently organising some workshops for the team. So yeah, I really do a big range of stuff. Um, but I would say that my second placement at Nats was on an ACP. So I was on one of the Nats ACP. And the experience that I got from that is what has allowed me to do my current role. Just, just for, uh, for the audience's benefit, Zoe, are you just happy to break down the acronym ACP? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so that's um, the airspace change um, process. So it's a specific seven step process set out by the Civil Aviation Authority. So any change to any 
airspace in the UK has to follow that process. Brilliant. Thank you, Zoe. Um, so some other interesting questions in the chat. So we do have one here that asks about um, any age restrictions for those who of us who have already lived one career choice. So I suppose what I'm keen to understand there is if that's linked specifically around the graduate scheme. Um, obviously, in terms of recruitment into NATS, there are there obviously, with the exception of air traffic control, there wouldn't be age restrictions at all. Um, We've got another uh, question here around a typical day of working in your role. So if uh, if I could ask, actually I'll come to you first, Linda, if that's OK. Can you describe to us a, a typical day in your role? Um, if there is one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, so um, because it's um, I work in software assurance, so that's making sure that any software that's going to be used by operationally does what it says on the tin and it's safe. So usually it's a lot of reviewing documents, you know, engineering documents that have been produced, um, trying to sort of pick out things that other people might not have picked out, challenge assumptions that have been made. Um, it involves um, gathering a lot of evidence as well so that we can present that to, the, to um, Sarge, which is part of CAA. So it's really just a lot of, at the moment, it's a lot of documentation, reviewing and writing reports. But obviously that's something you enjoy, Linda, otherwise you wouldn't be in the role. Yes, I do enjoy it immensely. Uh, so right, can I come to you next from, from a change management perspective? Again, um, obviously there may not per se be a typical day, but if you talk us through um, sort of a, a common pattern, I suppose, in terms of your day. Sure, the range. Um, so I guess there's sort of three three aspects again, but um, I might have a meeting with my my direct reports. So my team who manage you know all of our specialists in the area, and that would be to talk about any kind of um, well what their goals are for the week, what they're trying to achieve, and that's all sort of stacked up in terms of what we're where we're trying to get to as department, what we're trying to deliver, how they're doing about that, how they're doing with that. Um, Sometimes I just need somebody to listen to them, maybe help them with some thinking. Um, so we'll all be together on that call and any escalations that come up where they need some help, we'll do with those. Um, I might have then have a meeting with the senior leadership group across um, technical services across the company. And that will be about things that are happening at that level that are relevant to my team and my role. So that might just recently that could be about um, every five years, we have to submit a new plan to um, our regulator, the CAA, Linda referred to them a minute ago, um, and to customers who are both customers and our um, shareholders about what we want to do in the next five years, how much it's going to cost and what they're going to get for it. So I might be on a call to sort of um, provide information on the benefits or to take some actions. This is information that they're missing. This is a question that's come back from the regulator. Can we get some more data? Go to Camilla's team. Guys, we need you to run some safety sites. Can you tell us how that project's going to deliver safety in this hotspot or whatever? So there's a bit of that. Um, and then the third aspect might be, if I'm, if I'm this is all sort of very management-y, uh, if I'm lucky, I might get to dive in and do some sort of SME work. So um, I came, you know, I used SME subject matter expert. I used to do change management um, myself. So I might be working with one of my teams, either reviewing something that they've done, maybe challenging it from a specialist point of view, giving them some other things to think about, helping them work through their thinking, um, trying to fix a problem together. Um, so we could be doing that on change or equally I could be stuck with my benefits guys who are teaching me how to understand what they do and um, and seeing if I can bring a different perspective or a different thought process to to fixing some of their challenges. Um, yeah. That's it. Thank you, Sarah. And Jodie, I should imagine um, lots of people on the call today are, are very, very interested in terms of the role that you do in your world. So are you happy to give us a, a little bit of insight in terms of a, a day in uh, in your role? Yeah, so uh, there's probably not a typical day as such, but if you can imagine there's a team of about 200 people. So there is a, a, a lot of my time is taken up just with that pure people leadership type stuff so making sure that we've got the right number of people with the right skills in the right place to deliver a safe and, and resilient service every day so that that can be everything from 
um, looking at how we train people, how we uh, ensure that they're competent to carry out the roles, how are we developing our teams. Right now we're doing a lot of recruitment, so we are externally recruiting for people into our simulator at Prestwick and at, at, at uh, CTC at Whiteley um, to be pseudo pilots. So that is supporting air traffic control simulations where you um, effectively speak as though you are a pilot whilst typing in sort of commands that will then drive the, the computer system to sort of replicate what it's like um, for the air traffic controllers. So that's a really uh, interesting entry level job into NATS and then from that then a lot of our people then move on through our different operational support roles so um we are we've got quite an aging workforce in my business area so that's presented a bit of a a bit of a challenge if i say at 44 i'm one of the youngest people that work in my business area that will give you an idea of how much of a challenge we've actually got um so, uh, so i'll probably spend quite a lot of time thinking about how do we get new talent in how do we look at the services that we're providing and make sure that as the new technology delivers in the years to come, that the services we provide are updated and efficient uh, to continue to, to support the operation? Thank you, Jodie. Thank you. Now, I should have pointed out at the uh, beginning of this session this afternoon, and apologies for not, um, Linda and Jodie may have to disappear slightly earlier today because of childcare. Um, so obviously we will, if you, if you do have questions for either Linda or Jodie, then, then please do pop them in the chat um, as soon as possible. Um, one thing that I'm quite interested in, this is an open question for anybody actually on the panel, um, is whether whether you had a, a passion, I suppose, in, in terms of STEM and sort of science, technology, maths, engineering, when you were growing up, whether it was something that was sort of ingrained in you as you as you grew up or whether it was something that sort of came later down the line. So Kimina was really open and sort of talked about her experience and the, the focus on obviously the sciences and marine biology. But I'm keen to understand whether um, whether that was an ingrained passion or, or whether, being honest with you, a bit like myself, I stumbled into an engineering firm. So, so talk me through your experiences and whether there was a, with a passion there. And I will leave that open to the panel in terms of who wants to respond first. Um, I'm happy to go with that. Um, I was always pretty good at kind of the STEM subjects. I will caveat that my dad has a physics degree and my mum's a pharmacist. So science was all that was talked about in our house. Um, and I seemed to kind of absorb it, but I also knew like it was my best subjects at school and stuff. I also knew that I didn't want to wear a lab coat for my entire life. And childhood Zoe thought that if you did a science degree, you'd have to wear a lab coat for the rest of your life. Um, so actually, before I did anything tourism -y or airline-y, I did a certificate of higher education in food product design. So that's kind of like the science and nutrition of like what vitamin C does to your body and stuff. And I wanted to just test food for the rest of my life. And I thought it was a great compromise on science and food. And um, <laughs> it wasn't quite as glamorous as I thought. <laughs> um, so then I kind of made that switch over to aviation, but I didn't do it in a sciencey way. I went for the service industry side. And then from that fell into that going back into science. But no, my degrees weren't science based and um, purely because I was a bit terrified of wearing a lab coat for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. If I if I can even say I had the sciencey side, but I perceived the kind of job I do now as being too too mathsy for me, even coming from a numerical background. Yeah. Um, I got a C, I scraped a C at GCSE maths and never touched maths again. Um, despite in my head and viewing maths as something that I was not capable of doing, even though during my PhD I was doing statistical analysis. Because I often think you do get this idea of that's not the kind of job that I do, or it's not the kind of I, even though I like doing science, valued thinking creatively and presenting. And in my head, oh, the people who sit and crunch numbers all day, that's not me. Oh, if I could see myself now. Um, but and I think it's actually just kind of recognizing what bits do you like, not thinking too set on what the job is or what the job title is, it's what does it contain and what parts of the things that you do like will you be able to bring out in that job um so yeah and I think I think yeah kids kids get their hearts set on things but they also get their hearts set on things that they absolutely do not want and um it's just figuring out that actually you're it may be a lot more interesting than you give it credit for a bit of an element there coming about being open-minded perhaps 
And what, what advice on that note, I suppose, what advice might you give somebody in terms of considering career options? Because it's tough, right? When we're at school and we're trying to think about what we want to be when we're older, um, it's really challenging to understand what's available and, and what that looks like. So what advice would you potentially give somebody? I think it is just that, particularly if you're coming from either from school or from a further academic background, don't just focus on I did this subject, so I need a job in that subject area. It's what kind of skills does that feature and what kind of skills does that have? And it, it is that finding out what they do on a day to day basis. Um, sometimes I talk to students in schools who really enjoy biology, so they think consider whether they'd like to do a medical degree and then you say would you like to interact with and help ill people and they say oh no not really because there's that combination of actually I can like the contents of the job but not the reality and in fact do you like that that's that works that can work both ways that can be a really positive thing and I think particularly if you are coming like I did from a previous role from a job a subject area that you liked but you weren't wedded to think diversely about where you can get the bits that you do like because it might not be in the same area but it could be a surprisingly similar job in a very very different field and I think in roles like Nats most people don't come from an aviation background because those aren't always particularly easy to come by so coming into it new and fresh it's inherently exciting and inherently a little bit different. Thank you Gavina. I would say Helen just, I just wanted to add that the one thing that I would say about operational air traffic controllers and air traffic control assistants is there is absolutely no commonality in the background yeah. educational experience. Um, it is just so wide and varied. Uh, the the educational requirements to to become an air traffic controller and air traffic control assistant, I think it's five GCSEs are, are around about that kind of level and maybe to have studied beyond that, but not anything specific. So you meet people from all walks of life doing the job so I would definitely say that it's it, you know you don't need a specific skill set you don't need to have studied a specific subject you just need to have an aptitude which yeah. I think a lot of people would say oh it might be a bit spatial awareness or it might be a bit this or that I've no idea if those things are actually true all I all I would say is I think I wanted to do something that I didn't that no one else I knew was doing I like to show off a bit and I wanted to be kind of doing something that I thought would be quite interesting and when I met somebody that wasn't your traffic controller, I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. Um, you know, I, he, had a, he had a nice, he had, was leading a nice life. And I thought, oh, that's obviously a well paid job as well. Um, and then when I got into that, it's just so fascinating. And I think you forget about how fascinating it is when you've been here for a very long time. But actually, there's, there's no there's no common thing that holds together all the different people in the, the operational roles, really. I think that's a really good thing to call out both from Jodie and Camilla actually is in terms of the fact that we recruit individuals of a variety of background and not necessarily with the domain expertise of the areas that they're working in. There's a, a comment in the chat in terms of if you want to move into research roles at Nats, do you have to have had a bit a background in that area? Well, actually, the answer would be no. It very much depends on the role within that team. So we have a big research and development department. Um, and there'll be a variety of roles within that. So, right, do you want to do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, the thing I'd say is I entered Nats in corporate comms. I don't have a degree in science, and I now work in programs and portfolio management. And uh, you know, even within a science industry, even if you're interested in uh, people or you have an arts degree, the organisations are made up of people. And people that understand numbers and can express those really simply to people who don't have in-depth number is a beautiful skill. And um, so, so even if you are a good storyteller and you're curious about aviation and, 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 and data, then, you know, the degree you have doesn't matter. It's exactly as um, Camilla said, it's we look at skills. I look at skills when I'm hiring and other transferable. And then the last thing I'll say before I be quiet is, you know, where you come in, May not be and not be where you exit so yeah. you know there's it's also thinking about actually you know where do I want to start maybe curious about that for a couple of years and then where else could this lead me and is there the scope of that opportunity organization 
Absolutely. And that's where I would echo that. So I'm a humanities graduate. Um, I'd never worked in HR in my life before I joined Nats. Um, and my background was very different. So I think actually that what, what Nats as an employer is very good at is recognising skills and capability um, and really reflecting on the best use of that talent in terms of where they position that around the organisation. So the art of the possible definitely is there. Um, now, unfortunately, Linda and Jody have, have had to depart now. So um, and we've only got a few minutes left this afternoon. Um, but I suppose one one question that would be good to put to, to each of you actually before we close this afternoon is if you had one thing to say to a woman in particular and to encourage them to apply to Nats or an engineering firm, what would that be? I'll go. Um, I would say do it. Um, absolutely best decision I made. Um, I've been nothing but supported throughout. Yeah, absolutely. Just do it. Thank you, Zoe. So I, I'd say to I'd say mean it. So write a good application because, you know, employers want to be able to get a sense of who you are when we're reading cover letters and so on. We really want you to. We want people who are passionate about what we've done. So please do your research. So mean it and then believe you can. Walk into that interview believing you can make a difference. Thank you, Sarah. Camilla, anything else that you would add? I would say that there's no one image of a scientist or an engineer or a statistician or um, there's no one person who is that it's a huge diversity of people and that people includes people like you um, and however you think and whatever background you've come from if you can put your your heart and your meaning into it if you that's the thing you want to do you can absolutely pursue that and that is a very good place to pursue that Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So that sort of leads us to sort of bring this afternoon to a close, but it would be wrong of me to bring this afternoon to, to a close without a shameless plug. <laughs> and that plug is obviously for many of you that have joined the session this afternoon. First of all, thank you, but also really to encourage you to consider career at NATS. As we've said, um, no matter what point you are within your career, well, I know there'll be many people on the call today who probably are joining us because they're interested in our early career schemes. Obviously, they are open currently. Like I said, we've got 49 positions that are currently live. Um, looking forward to welcoming wow. our early careers cohort in, in September this year. But we are keen to continue to recruit, obviously, in multiple roles across our organisation. Um, so what we would like to do is obviously for you to keep connected with us, for you to consider us as an employer. There are multiple ways where you can hear about opportunities, both in terms, obviously, of our website, but also through our social media channels as well. Um, also, following today's session, if you do have any questions at all, then please, please, please feel free to reach out to us. Obviously, you would have received an invite for us for this session so more than happy to continue to respond in terms of questions and if there are any questions that we haven't got to today and I apologies if we haven't um, we will seek to ensure that we respond to all of you on all of the questions that were asked this afternoon um, I'd also like to thank our panel members who've been absolutely fantastic this afternoon. So thank you so much, obviously, first of all, for offering to support us, but most importantly, for sharing your journeys, sharing your insights um, and your personal experiences. It's been really, really valuable. So again, thank you to everybody who's been able to join this afternoon. Um, it's been lovely having so many people obviously listening in in terms of our inspirational stories. And hopefully we will see many of you very shortly. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.